My name is Ingo Philipp. I'm on the product management team at Tricentis. Tricentis is a software company and it's based in Vienna. And that's all you need to know about uh, my company and about myself. So I won't talk any longer about my company and the products uh, we have. So this won't be a sales pitch now. I would like to exclusively focus on uh, yeah, one of my lovely sisters and that's exploratory testing. And uh, there are many, many reasons why I want to do that. This is probably one of them. Now, guys, this is probably how your management, especially C-level management, looks like, right? When you stop talking about the cool stuff out there, right? Automation. And when you start talking about the necessity of deep testing, that is exploratory testing. Now, and what about you? Well, you most probably then will look like this, or that's at least how I look like when I'm at a release party and nobody wants to talk about the essence of testing at those parties. Now, what I usually tell those guys in management when I'm in those meetings is something like that. I let them know that if you don't pay attention to what has your attention, then it will take more of your attention than it deserves. And what it simply means is, if you don't pay attention to testing right from the beginning, only to automation, then testing will take your attention sooner or later. Now, here is a visualization of what I've just said. A typical software testing timeline. And this is usually composed of four sections as displayed here. Now, in the first one, the people are usually saying, well, testing, what the heck is that, right? There is only automation. We automate everything, right? And it then takes quite a while until those people then fall down what I call the mount of stupid and then immerse into what is known as the valley of despair, right? And when they arrived at this valley, then they usually say, okay, there is testing, and testing is probably more than just automation, but we are not convinced yet, right, that we really need it. And the two last sections then usually looks like this, right? So let's now zoom in into the last two sections to see what's uh, going on there. So now, guys, I need your imagination. Imagine that all these dots here represent your test cases, all your test cases in your regression test portfolio, for example. And now imagine that all these test cases pass in the last regression test run before you decide to ship your product into production. And then you might conclude, well, that looks good, right? Ship it, ship our software products. And that is what you then most probably will do. But just a second later, you will see something like this, right? You will see that repetitive test case execution is by far not enough to see that iceberg coming. And that is usually the point where the people then start talking and thinking about exploratory testing. So let me now briefly share the story with you how I got to know the concept of exploratory testing a couple of years ago. Now, guys, that's me. That's me in my early days as a tester. And in these days, I was asked by one of my test managers to figure out what exploratory testing really means. But already right at the beginning of my journey to find an answer to those questions, I was stuck. I simply didn't understand it, right? In the same way, I don't understand why we always press hard on the remote when the batteries are dead, right? Or why the heck the dentist talks to you when you aren't able to respond. So the bottom line here is, guys, that exploratory testing at that time was something totally incomprehensible to me, like this one. And I've then tried to, to escape from this dilemma. So I've started talking to people. And I've met people treating exploratory testing and manual testing as one and the same thing. And no, guys, a Bitcoin and a Super Mario coin are not the same thing. So I quickly realized that exploratory testing is a thing most people pretend to understand, but really don't. And then I met people treating exploratory testing like a religion, like a philosophy, or like modern art, right? And as we all know, modern art is just a disaster area, right? Because never in the field of human history so much has been used by so many to say so little. And all these guys just said one thing to me, that exploratory testing is like teenage sex. Or to be more precise, people talking about exploratory testing are like teenagers talking about sex. Now, why is that? Well, because everyone nowadays talks about it, right? But nobody really seems to know what it is and how to do it, right? 
And because of the fact that everyone talks about it, everyone thinks that everyone else is doing it, and because of that, everyone claims they're doing it. So the question now is, and that is the question I really would like to answer now, is what the heck is it? Now let's start with these guys. This is how I see the discipline of software development. And you know, I've been a product manager for a couple of years at various software companies. To me, the discipline of software development is a lot like wrestling in the mud with a pig. And after a couple of hours, you just start realizing that the pig just loves it, right? Wrestling with you in the mud. Now, when this is software development, guys, the question then is, what is then software testing? Well, then software testing is all about washing that pig, right? And that can be messy, because it usually has no rules, no clear beginning, no clear middle, and no clear end. And sometimes, honestly, it's kind of a pain in the ass. Because when you're done, you're not sure if the pig is really clean or why you were even washing the pig in the first place. So now let's see how we wash that pig, guys. Let's see how we test software. And now I need your imagination again. Let's now imagine that this rectangle represents your software product. It represents the entire functional and non-functional spectrum of your software. So that's all there is, and that's all you could possibly know about your software. Try to imagine that. Now then, this green rectangle represents all what you currently know about your software. And this rectangle is apparently smaller than the previous one, because I'm at least convinced that you will never be able to always know everything about your software down to the very last detail. Now, the red rectangle then represents everything we repeatedly check in our software through, for example, test automation. And again, this rectangle is smaller than the previous one, because you will never be able to check everything at any time, in any place in your software, right? Because of the time, the resource, and the budget constraints you are confronted with. Now here the question is, well, would it even make sense to strive for that? Would it even make sense to strive to automate, to, to codify all your knowledge? Well, most people would say, yes, of course, it's the ultimate goal, right? But I'm saying no. Because if you would solely aim to codify all your knowledge, then the question is, how on earth would you then ever be able to create new knowledge about your software? And you have to create new knowledge about your software, because your software constantly grows. And so you constantly need to increase the knowledge about your software to detect problems in your software that are far, far outside your checking regime. And that is what testing means to me. Testing is all about closing this knowledge gap. It's all about closing the gap between what we know and what we don't know about our software products. So that means testing is far more about information than just automation. And the reason for this is simple. Kem Kana once explained it to me like this. He said, Ingo, look, a test case is just a question you ask your software. And the point of running that test the point of asking this question is to gain information about your software in order to be able to detect risks, problems that might happen in your software. So that means that testing is, always has been, and always will be a search for information. And we search for in that information to enable people, other people, to make better decisions based on the information we provide. Based on the information we provide, we want to enable, for example, business people like product owners, product managers to make business decisions like shipping decisions. We also enable technical people like developers, right, to make technical decisions like fixing decisions. That's what we do. So the bottom line here is that to me, testing is an information service and I'm not degrading the act of testing by saying this. So we are kind of investigators, I would say. We are kind of people like Sherlock Holmes. And the other day, I read, I read a nice article about Sherlock Holmes, about the myths of Sherlock Holmes. And in that article, it was stated that Sherlock Holmes goes to crime scenes and he searches for evidence to enable the police to arrest the culprits. And I thought, that's exactly what we are doing, right, in our daily testing business. I mean, we don't go to crime scenes, or somehow we do, right? It's our software. And here we search for a very specific kind of evidence. These are the risks in our software products, problems that might happen there, in order to enable other people like developers, as said, to fix the bugs. Now the question is, how do we search for that information? Well, from my point of view, we can break up 
testing in two testing cultures. The first one is all about confirmatory testing. The second one is all about exploratory testing. So these are, to me, the two sides of testing. Now, confirmatory testing is a very mechanical approach to testing, especially when it comes to test automation. Because automation is just doing what automation does, right? It just processes predefined data through your application in a predefined way. That's it. Now, in contrast to that, exploratory testing is more like an intelligent or creative approach to testing. Here you learn about your product, you design tests, you execute those tests, and you interpret the test results all at the same time. So you do all of this simultaneously. And in doing so, your next test is always influenced by the results of the last test you did. And that's, by the way, the reason why we call this approach to testing exploratory testing which simply means for the purpose of discovery, right? Now, this then implies that the purpose of confirmatory testing, you can safely replace that by test automation. That's just a subset of, that, uh, of confirmatory testing. So the purpose of it is to monitor known risks. So here you just confirm what you already know. Here you just confirm your already existing beliefs. Whereas the purpose of exploratory testing is to analyze potential risks. So here you should focus on things you don't know. You should focus on illusions you're holding true without any empirical evidence. Now this then says that there's a high information value associated with any exploratory test. Why? Because we learn something new about the application. And that's definitely not the case with any confirmatory tests. So the bottom line here is that confirmatory tests are change detectors. Now, why is that? Well, imagine you add some new functionality on top of your big, fat software product, right? And then you want to know if that newly introduced functionality has some bad impact on your already existing functionality. So what do you do in that case? You run your automated regression test set. On the other side of that fence, exploratory tests are more like problem detectors. And James Buck once put it this way. He said, here, it is all about exploring the unknown, the invisible, to avoid the unthinkable happening to the anonymous. And I'm just in love with that definition, honestly. Now, this implies that confirmatory testing is all about checking. Now, Michael Bolton once defined checking in this way. He said, it's about evaluating a product by applying algorithmic decision rules to specific observations of a product. So what the heck does it even mean, right? In simple terms, this means that here you just ask for the question, is there a problem here? Or does this assertion pass or fail? I'm sorry for that. So does this assertion pass or fail? That's the question you want to answer. Now, this question always has a, bi a binary answer. Like it's either yes or no, it's on or off, it's one or zero, right? And this means that this process of answering this question is machine decidable. And so it's algorithmic. And this implies it's, it can be automated. And this means it should be automated, right? Because we don't want human testers doing something a machine can do, right? We want them doing exploratory testing, where you evaluate your software product by exploration and experimentation. And this usually requires a hell of a lot human capabilities, like modeling, studying, questioning, making inferences, and a hell of a lot critical thinking. So to sum it up, guys, when you check, you verify through very specific instructions. And those instructions are usually contained in your test cases. So here, you only pay attention to the deviations from the expected results in your test cases. This means checking, and so confirmatory testing is all about creating test cases. It's all about following specific procedures. Why? To examine specific conditions in your requirements. For example, acceptance criteria in your user stories. And when you reduce testing to checking, then you reduce testing to a factory process, where you put requirements into that factory and you get test cases out. Now, on the other side of that fence, exploratory testing is all about investigating a product through making powerful experiments. And those experiments are driven mainly by testing heuristics, right? And here you don't just pay attention to the deviations from the expected results in your artifacts like test cases. Here you pay attention to any kind of test oracles that let you decide whether there is a problem here. 
So here you just answer the question, there might be a problem or there might not be a problem, instead of trying to answer the question in terms of passed or failed. So this means that exploratory testing is all about creating test ideas, not creating test cases. And here you follow your clues. And it's the risks and your findings that is guiding your search. Now this means that exploratory testing really makes testing an adaptive investigation rather than a factory process. Now don't get me wrong, guys. I'm not saying here that I am valuing exploratory testing over confirmatory testing. I'm not saying that I'm valuing exploratory testing over test automation. That would be way, way too simple. All I want to say here is that it's not just about the one and it's not just about the other. It's about both. It's about both at the same time. And therefore, we regard something as thoroughly tested in all of our testing projects when it has been checked by efficient formal test automation, and when it has been explored by the richness of intellect of human beings, by you guys. Now, that's at least our agile testing equation, and it always reminds us that we should never forget there are always two sides of the same testing coin. Now, when I'm talking about checking, I'm talking basically about two things, because a check can be performed by machine, right? Then we call it machine checking. Some call it test case automation. But it also can be performed by a human being, right? By a human tester, by you guys. Then we call it human checking. So I just want to make sure that when I'm talking about manual testing, I'm basically talking about two things. I'm talking about two manual testing activities. That is human checking on the one hand and exploratory testing on the other hand. Both are manual, human-driven activities. And because of that fact, because of the presence of exploratory testing, part of manual testing, I'm convinced that manual testing will always have a place in any fast-paced development process. It will always have a place in DevOps, until, of course, some general purpose artificial intelligence like Skynet comes around right, and takes over the world. But guys, this won't happen in the next few weeks, and this won't happen in the next few years. Not even AI research knows how to go for artificial general intelligence that is really required to replace the human thought process in testing. Now, the good news here is that you don't need to be a smart person or you don't need to have a bright mind to do exploratory testing, right? Exploratory testing is not a talent. It's a, it's a skill, or to be more precise, it's a set of skills. And the good news is you can learn those skills. So let me now show you how we do it. Let me now show you how we translate the approach of exploratory testing into reality. Because that is what exploratory testing is to me. It's an approach. It doesn't tell us how to do it. It just tells us what to do. So let, let me now show you our technique, how we put exploratory testing into practice by providing a systematic procedure for it. Now, our technique is composed of five components from the bird's eye perspective. The first one is what we call session-based testing. It's also known as session-based test management. Now, what session-based testing does to exploratory testing, it takes exploratory testing and puts it into a straight jacket, like this one here. So it means it puts all the imagination that comes along with exploratory testing into that straight jacket. And now we might say, well, that's bad, right? You can't do that. Well, guys, you're absolutely right. It's not optimal, but there ain't no free lunch. The reason why we do that is to make exploratory testing structured. Why? Because it's easy to do exploratory testing consistently for one, two, or three teams. But it's damn hard to do exploratory testing consistently for 30, 40, 50, or more teams in a truly agile enterprise. And the reason why we want to do it consistently is to make it measurable. And session-based testing is a concept that makes exploratory testing at least to some extent measurable. And so it makes it management compatible. So that's just one of those reasons why we go for session-based testing. Now, the core object of session-based testing is the session. And the session, according to John Back, is nothing more than a reviewable, chartered, and uninterrupted testing effort. It's an uninterrupted unit of testing effort. 
And this testing effort usually is time boxed to, for example, 30 minutes, two hours, three hours, or four hours. And the reason why we time box our sessions is not just for the sake of being cool and time boxing our sessions. No, there is a reason for that. And the reason goes like this in short terms. So you know that the, the functional, the non-functional spectrum of your software product is often so attractive that you get so easily lost into details, right? That you get so easily lost into digging into the same hole deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, right? And when you have a deadline, a time box, it somehow prevents you doing that. And that's one of those reasons why we time box our session, to always keep in mind the scope we need to cover. Now, the core object of a session is the session charter. And what the session charter is, is nothing more than a mission statement for all the people that are part of that exploratory testing session. And usually that charter has two things in it. The first one is the scope, and the second one are the goals of your session. Now, how do we define the scope? Well, here we go for a traditional requirements-based testing approach. Now, I know what you're now saying. Well, you know the term requirements in the agile world, right? It's, it's almost forbidden now to even say that. But to me, a requirement is nothing more than just a service, a service we provide through our software to our end users so that these end users can achieve their goals, whatever they are. Okay? And I don't care if you express those requirements as user stories, epics, and themes, or system use cases, business use cases, or stakeholder needs, features. Take whatever you like. At the end of the day, requirements still will remain services. We provide for our software products to our end users so that they can do whatever they want to do. And so we take those requirements to define the scope of our session, to define the boundary or the straight jacket you have seen before. Now, when we explore those requirements, we don't just compare the actual product to a description of it, that means to the specification, for example, or design documentation of the product. We also compare the actual product to the product idea. And we also compare the product idea to a description of the product. So testing is definitely more than just checking the specification. So it's more than just verification, it's also about validation, at least to some degree. And by just keeping that in mind, we just not only make sure that we're building the product right, we also want to make sure if we build the right product right. And the reason for this is simple. Our software is just a solution. It is just a solution for someone's problem, right? And if the problem isn't solved with our software, then the product does not work. So we need to be aware of the fact for whom we are building our products. And that's the reason why we pay so much attention to figure out who are our stakeholders, who are the people for whom we are building our products, right? And that's the reason why we do that, why we compare those three amigos. Now, when we do that, we apply a set of different techniques, like specification by example, like BDD. Now, BDD to us is just the art of using examples in conversations to illustrate behavior. That is what we already apply, for example, during sprint planning or backlog refinement, backlog grooming, for example, in order to break those abstract acceptance criteria down to concrete examples. So BDD is not a tool for test case automation, and we don't use it for test case automation. We use it as a tool to create a shared understanding among all the team members. And it's a really powerful technique. And here is the reason why we do that. Now imagine that this circle represents everything the product owner thinks about, right? When he designs his products, when he writes the user story. Then this is usually what the product owners can put into words. Then this is what they usually say to their teammates. And this is usually what you understand. And this not only holds true for the product owner, this holds true for every single person on the team. And what I want to say by that is there's a huge gap in understanding. And techniques like BDD, specification by example, they really help to close this gap in understanding, at least to some degree, by providing concrete, simple examples to the often abstract acceptance criteria in your user stories, epics, or even themes. Now, when we then get our software products into our hands, we also apply a set of testing heuristics, like this one here. It's uh, called RCRCRC RC, RC by Karen Johnson. 
That's the mnemonic of that testing heuristic. And a testing heuristic is nothing more than just a set of guideline questions you can make use of in order to do your exploration in a structured way. They just help you to do your exploration structurally. And this one is especially helpful when you are confronted with a software product that is constantly under change. There, is, there are a bunch of other heuristics out there, like this one here by James Buck. It's uh, called SFDPOT. It stands for San Francisco Debo. And this one is, for example, especially helpful when you are confronted with a completely new software product, with something that is unfamiliar with you. So it's a set of questions that allows you to learn about your product and so to explore it more efficiently and also more effectively at the end of the day. And there is a hell of a lot of other heuristics out there, right? So I don't want to go through all of them now, just make use of them. I just want to have that mention that this is an essential part of our exploratory testing technique. Now, guys, this was in short terms how we make exploratory testing structured through session-based testing and how we define the scope and explore the scope during the sessions. So as I've said, there are two things in the session charter, the scope and the goals. That's at least what we define in our session charter in the mission statement for a session. Now let's see how we define the goals. Now to define the goals, we apply an approach which is known as tour-based testing. Please raise your hands if you know already what tour-based testing is. Who of you does not know what tour-based testing is? Okay, there seems to be a third group here <laughs> in the audience. Okay, there's a hell of a lot of people here not knowing what it is. Now, what is it? Well, a testing tour is not just uh, taking a test case and then calling it a tour. It's the entire metaphor. A testing tour to us is an exploration around a specific theme. And there are many, many different schools of tour testing out there. And within those schools of tour testing, there are many different testing tours. Now, the approach I like most, because it's most of fun, I would say, is the one proposed by James Whittaker in his book, Exploratory Software Testing in 2009. And in this book, he's talking about a bunch of different testing tours, like the supermodel tour, the museum tour, the FedEx tour, the couch potato tour, the money tour, the saboteur, for example. And you might have already heard about them, right? So what these tools are doing for you is they provide you with a crystal clear focus of your session. They provide you with a test focus. Let's take an example, the FedEx tool here. You know what FedEx is? Right, the label in the package delivery world, right? Now what FedEx does is they move packages from one destination center to another around the globe. That is what FedEx basically does, right? And you're kind of doing the same in that testing tour. So that means you take a piece of data, you create a piece of data in your software products, like <coughs> a customer in your banking application, and then you try to find every single feature that somehow purges, deletes, or modifies that, pieces, that piece of data. And the reason why you want to do that is to make sure that you have a consistent data flow in your application. And that's it. That's your test focus. You just want to make that sure. Another example is the supermodel tour. That's my favorite, by the way. It's not because it's called Supermodel Tour. It's because it is it's such a powerful tour when there's a lot of UI development going on in your product development. Now, here the main mantra is to think superficially. And I think that was the reason why they called it the Supermodel Tour, right? So what you do here, you just pay attention to the user interface. You don't even care that there is a backend, right? And this makes sure that you find UI failures or problems on your user interface fast. So that means the main mantra here is to not go beyond skin deep, right? Think superficially. Again, that's just another technique to provide a focus to your testing session. Now, the reason, guys, why we do all this, I think it's obvious, right? We want to maximize one quantity. And that is quality, right? Or to be more precise, it's quality, it's speed. I think every one of you knows perfectly what speed means, right? But quality, right? What the heck is that, right? And it's still not really clear to me, honestly. It's, it's a really fuzzy term. So I looked it up at the dictionaries a couple of years ago. And in those dictionaries, you find things like, it's the degree of excellence of something. 
right? When I say, well, that's a good thing, right? I usually say that's excellent. Now, the question then here is, who measures this degree of excellent? And the point is, it's measured by someone. And I think this was the reason why Jerry Weinberg, 20 years ago, then came up and said, well, quality is just value to some person who matters at some time. That's it. And this implies that quality is inherently subjective. And this means that different stakeholders will perceive the same software product as having different levels of quality. And this guy says so much about bugs, right? James Buck once said it, a bug is something that bugs somebody. And what it means is that a bug, a software bug is not necessarily within our software products. It's more about the relationship, the people who are using the software that have with the software, okay? So a bug is anything that might threaten the value of our software products. And the cool thing as a product manager is that you can so easily resolve those bugs by just replacing the stakeholders, guys. So it's a good, good, and a very efficient way to fix your bugs. Now, what it means for us? Well, it means for us that we must look for different things for different stakeholders in our testing, right? Essentially, this means we must diversify testing. And that is exactly what we are trying to do. And this leads us to component number four of our technique to exploratory testing, which we call polygram testing. I know that's a bad name, but what polygram means, it just means multiple colors, right? Monochrome, polychrome. It basically means doing an art of work in multiple colors. And that is what we're trying to do with testing too. Now, how do we do that? Well, we are applying an, an a concept which is known as the six thinking heads. Please raise your hands if you know what this concept is about. The six thinking heads. Just a few guys here. So let me briefly explain what it is. So first of all, this concept has absolutely nothing to do with testing at all. It is a concept that is being used for more than 20 years already to solve business issues in general. And the core components of the concept are the so-called six thinking hats. And they're literally hats, as displayed here. And each hat, as you can see, has a different color associated with it. And each color stands for a certain viewpoint, a certain thinking direction, right? For example, the black one stands for critical thinking, the green one for creative thinking, the white one for factual thinking, or the red one for emotional thinking. So what we do is, when we set up an exploratory testing session, we invite multiple people, and not just testers. We also invite testers from other teams. We invite developers, we invite product owners. We invite people from operations like DBA, system administrators, people who are scaling and running our products on a daily basis. We also try to invite customers, right, in case you have access to them. And that's a pretty hard thing. Now, this already diversifies your exploratory testing session. Now, optionally, we also give them the, the option to take a specific head. And they literally take the heads when they're testing, right, at Tricenters in our projects, in order to think about our software from different viewpoints. And that's a really, really powerful technique. Although it's pretty hard to get used to it, it pays off at the end of the day although it's, it's not really measurable but from my point of view, but it's definitely fun to do it. Now, that is, in short terms, how we diversify testing. And in case you're interested in how to apply that, so I think uh, it was mentioned at the beginning that we have a, a short recap of the session or a discussion afterwards, right? So you can meet me outside and we can do a, a small example to apply that concept. It just will take us 15 minutes, in case you're interested. So that's the technique we make use to diversify our testing. The last component is all about scenario-based testing. And this is just a fancy name of saying we try at least to capture each and every test idea we have during our exploration to make our outcome reviewable. And it's important because after an exploratory testing session, you usually have debriefing sessions. So we in our projects always have so-called session owner, that's the guy who is responsible for setting up that session, the guy who writes the charter, invites the persons, 
And this guy, the session owner, then has a debriefing session, an after discussion with each and every tester to decide about the next tests and to decide about the next sessions properly. Because you will never be able to always test everything right in your session. You can always test as much as possible. And so this debriefing session, we're just using it to define the next uh, steps properly. That means to make it somehow reviewable. Now, that's in short terms, guys, how we roll exploratory testing in our projects. Now, let's sum it up. Uh, let's come to the lessons we uh, have learned, hopefully. Number one, James Buck, I need to cite him again, but I think he nailed it by saying testing is not about creating test cases. It's about performing powerful experiments. And that is usually what involves a lot of human capabilities, right? As mentioned, questioning, studying, modeling, and a hell of a lot of critical thinking. So guys, speaking in terms of test cases that must be developed is a misleading way to discuss testing. So testing is not test cases, right? As evangelized by Bolton, Kahn, and Weinberg for the last 25 years or so. So testing is much more than that. It's an open-ended intellectual activity. Why? Well, guys, a test, and so a test case does not find the bug, right? It's you, it's the human who finds the bug, and the test just plays a role in helping the human to find that bug. And what it means is that the success of your testing does not necessarily depend on the number of artifacts you create in terms of test cases, it depends on the quality of your test ideas, okay? I always say to those guys, well, when you have a test case, right, there is always a test behind that test case. And behind that test, there is always a test idea. And behind the test idea, there is always a human being still. We don't have artificial general intelligence yet. So that means if your test case sucks, guys, then you might suck, okay? So just to make it clear, that's at least my mantra, okay? I remind myself about that when I see that my test case are failing in whatever manner, okay? So this means we should not over-focus on automation in testing because that's kind of insane, right? Why? Because an automated check, an automated test case miss, will miss the same obvious things every single time. And according to Albert Einstein, that's exactly what insanity is, right? Insanity is doing the same things over and over and over again and expecting different results. You can't expect different results in its full entirety, but just running your automated test cases. So my message of hope to all the test managers in that room is, guys, if you want to become bad at testing, then please don't just hire somebody who is better at coding. Because my experience has shown to me multiple times that it is far often better to have someone who can look at a requirement and is able to work out what needs to be tested than having someone who can code but has no clue how to test something. Why? Because testing to me is not so much a thing you do, it's much more a way you think, guys. So testing is a thinking process. And if we want to change the way we test, we need to change the way we think. Thank you so much, guys. have uh, a lot of time for questions. У нас 20 минут на вопросы примерно. Пожалуйста, поднимайте руку и я принесу микрофон. Guys, don't be afraid of asking questions. Testing is the discipline where you bombard, right? Your friends uh -huh. with, with questions. Do. So don't be shy to do that. So my question, hello, <laughs> thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I have a question. How you mentioned to spread a line between uh, uh, mechanical testing and creative testing in resources. How to find this um, edge, I, maybe, between this, how to find the balance? So first of all, I would like to mention that they are not separated from each other, right? I always keep in mind that exploration unlocks confirmation, okay? So that your exploratory testing unlocks test cases. So that means that test cases won't be created just by pure magic and they are there. <laughs> no, no, you have to do a hell of a lot in order to get those test cases, right? So that means when I'm, for example, writing a test case, that 
check I'm creating by that test case is surrounded by a bunch of skills, by a bunch of testing skills, where, for example, the first thing I need to do is I need to identify risk, right, in my software products. Because if I don't have a question about my risks in my software, I don't have any reason to test, right? So the first thing I need to do. What does this imply? This implies I need to understand my software product. I need to learn about it. So, you know, you see, Exploration is already a big, big part in order to derive the check. I just create the check in order to make sure to get rid of this dreary, uninterest uninteresting, repetitive tasks I do. Okay? And this is important that you get away of this effort. Then the question I would rather ask is, how much time do I spend in creating those checks, those automated test cases? For me, that's always a question of risk. So how much risk do I want to mitigate with that? Okay? And that's a hard question, right? It, it depends on so many models you create of your software products. For example, risk models, risk coverage models. But it's always a question of risk. That means when we have measured that, by the way, in a couple of projects, and especially when you have new software to test, then it's about 85 to 20, where you have 85% just spending on exploration and experimentation, and 15% you're using to create, to automate, and to maintain those test cases, right? Where maintenance <laughs> takes up about 70%, right? Creating your framework and, and maintaining your framework. So it, it's not a separation, so I can't tell you now, 58% exploration and the rest is confirmation. It's always an interchange and it's your decision based on the models you are using to decide what to automate, what to put into a test case and what not automate. Does it somehow answer your question? Okay, cool. Any other questions? There, yeah. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's move on with you. I think we can't hear you. Uh, Say it, I will repeat the question. Uh, my question is, uh, your approach seems quite a large scale one. Uh, is it applicable for smaller companies or teams? Because as you describe it, you create quite, you uh, grab quite a large of people to execute a testing session. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So yes, uh, so this whole concept was especially designed for larger scale implementations, for larger scale projects. But nevertheless, when you have a look at all those components that are, you know, make off that concept, that is basically applicable for anybody. It's applicable for you, right? Does anything prevent you from using testing heuristics in testing? No. Does anything prevent you from making use of the six thinking heads during your testing? No. Does anything prevent you from doing anything that I've shown you during your testing? No. So the question by that, in my point of view, by definition is already answered, right? It's just my perspective. I don't know if you agree with that. The point is, um, this is this is like a process. And I know, you know, I, I don't like to, to, to create processes, to have to a, a rigid structure in it. But sometimes you need it in order to give the people something they can um, make use of for orientation, for example, especially in those larger scale testing projects where we have a bunch of teams that need to collaborate. So my answer to your question is no, all those things I've explained are absolutely applicable for an individual person, for an individual tester too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, there's, a, there's one question. Oh, don't, sorry, I already forgot. <laughs> Uh, when you are hiring somebody, how do you evaluate uh, their exploratory skills? Or how would you evaluate if you would hire someone? By talking to each other. No, no, really, really, that's, that's the major point, right? So, of course, we try to measure it, okay? We have our metrics. We have our KPIs to do that. But we are also well aware that you can't blindly assume to take all the complex and complicated things that is going on in your brain during testing and then I put it into a number and I know exactly what you did, right? So what we pay a lot of attention to is, as I've mentioned, in those debriefing sessions, right? And there are other types of tiny sessions we carry out, just to uh, give you a few examples. Uh, we do a lot of, of pair testing, for example. And and we do this um, in different styles. For example, we do tear testing with a tester and a developer. We still have dedicated testers on our team. 
And we like to do that, by the way. So a test and a developer, what we do with them is we give them, let's say, a user story to test, right? Or we give them a product component, for example, or a use case. And they test them separately from each other for, let's say, 20 minutes. And after those 20 minutes, they do a debriefing with each other. So that means the test explains the developer what he did and why he did the testing in the way he did it. And also the developer tells those testers what he did and why he did that. And so you exchange knowledge. And this uh, also increases collaboration. And this means that the one then learns from the other in the most effective way. We, you can also carry out pair testing in a different way, where you say, well, you have those two guys, and that can be anybody, by the way, right? can also be a product owner with uh, the guy who writes the documentation or the, the manual of your software product. And the one, you know, the one is like the operator and sits and just does exactly what the other person tells him to do, right? That's right. That's one method you can do. Um, so it, it's all about collaboration and communication, okay? Does it somehow help? Oh. Ah, that, oh, okay, that, that's good. Yeah, so th this, is, this, is, uh, this is tough. This is definitely tough. In our interview sessions, we usually talk in general more about what testing means to those guys. So I see a lot of people that are in the testing business for more than 20 years already that aren't able to explain to me in a simple sentence what testing means to me, okay? So that's the first criteria. And I say, oh, no, 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 no. So you're definitely not the person we are looking for, okay? So the first thing we do. And then we are asking like, things like, do you know what a heuristic is? Can you explain to me what an oracle, for example, is to you, right? It, it, really simple things, the most basic things you can think about. And this gives you already within 20 or 30 minutes in your interview session at least a feeling if the person really knows the game he's playing or not, okay? I can give you an exhausted list of the questions we ask afterwards. This is a list of, I think now, 84 questions we have uh, consolidated over the last years, and they just have, this is a guideline system we make use of, okay? Just make use of it. Any other questions? There was here. Yes. Uh, how much time? How much time to spend on exploratory testing if you are working in agile team, and uh, you have releases monthly? I didn't understand the second part of the question. Uh, I am working in agile team, mm -hmm. and we have releases uh, every month. And uh, I want to do exploratory. I have test cases in test rail to do regression testing. I have automated some cases. And I want to know how much time to spend on exploratory. I think we already had the question here, right? And uh, I don't want to repeat it. But um, just keep in mind, what is the reason why you're testing? I always say, as I've tried to point out, we provide information. And I need to provide the information as fast as possible. So what I can suggest to you, if you're asking the question, how much time should I end it? You should, you should try to aim to provide feedback as fast as possible back to your developers or to your product owners about whatever you find. This implies that you should avoid asking the first question like, how do I automate this? <laughs> You know, this is usually a question I've, 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 I hear a lot during sprint planning or backlog refinement. This is not really challenging and questioning and scrutinizing the user story. They're just thinking about how the heck can I automate this stuff, right? That's not the question you should ask first, right? So the point of doing testing is to provide that information fast. So as I've said before, I can't give you now a ratio, 80 or 20, right? It always depends on the risk that is involved in your checks, and it depends on your models you're using to measure that, right? And this then lets you decide what to automate and what not to make. We, I think we can discuss this question, how much time should I spend on exploratory testing and confirmatory test and test automation than afterwards in, in, in a bit more uh, romantic setup, or I don't know how to call that. <laughs> We're even closer to each other, okay? Okay, thank you. I, I hope that somehow does it for now. Any other questions, guys? Hi, hello. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry if, uh, if my question is too specific for you, but uh, what is the biggest defect you uh, have found 
in, through exploratory testing, such like sinking uh, Titanic. The, the biggest impact? Biggest defect. defect. Biggest defect? Defect or bugs. Or the biggest defect we have found by, by, by testing? Um, yeah. Uh, Yes, do you yeah. want to hear now a, a horror story of all, of, of, of the uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, in, in short story, I, I will. I can show you a, a few funny ones if you want. <laughs> you know, I'm always prepared to show this. These are actually not the ones I have found. Let me bring up another slide deck here. I have a bunch of this stuff here. There is a, uh, I have mentioned the book Exploratory Software Testing and from James Whittaker. And in this book, I, I really recommend to read it because it's just fun to read it. And um, here he discusses a hell of a lot of uh, software errors. And he don't just, you know, discusses how entertaining they are. He also discusses what you can learn from them. Okay, that's the important stuff. Because there's a lot of information in those errors. So let me show you a few of them. Um, where is that stuff? Here you go. Let me scroll down a bit. We still have 10 minutes time and definitely a few more questions left. You know, you can see it doesn't really work out here because I need to make it visual. Because there are a lot of things which says a lot about what we miss to test. No, I'm sorry. Collapse all. Ah, here you go. Here are my fails. <laughs> um, th this is one of my favorites, actually. So if you, if you can't see it in the back, this error message states, an error has occurred while displaying the error that's occurred while creating the error report. You know, the, the reason why I'm showing that we have a bunch of those <laughs> error messages also in, our, in the software products we grade, right? Now, what it does to me is, um, first of all, you need to figure out how, how do you find these sort of bugs, right? How do you find them? It, it, this, here we are deep in the bowels of the error exception routines, right? The question is, how do you get there, right? Is black box exploratory testing enough for that, right? Do you need, can this be done by test automation? The thing is, and this, this specific error message reminds me always about one thing, that we, not, we are not just looking for functional problems, for example, in our software. We are looking for problems that are related to all the software quality attributes out there. This is functionality, this is performance, this is scalability, this is availability, this is um, safety, security, this is performance, this is usability, and this is also understandability. Okay? <laughs> and this, this, because why? A bug, as I've said, is something that bugs somebody, anything that might threaten the value of a product. And I think that might threaten our <laughs> software, or the value of our software products, right? It makes our software products less understandable, okay? So this is, this is one of them. And I think you have already seen uh, that hilarious one. This is, uh, this is an actual one from Google Maps. Here, the user wants to go from Oslo to Stockholm and Google Maps suggested this route to him, right? It's hilarious. And uh, this, this is the actual bug. This was presented as an internal Google conference 10 years ago or something like that. And uh, uh, we've also investigated that and say, okay, how do we find these bugs, right? And there's a lot you need to learn about to find that bug fast, okay? And I don't want to find those bugs by accident. I want to find that bugs by a specific procedure. So what, what it means is we need to learn. We, for example, need to learn so that we know that those maps, for example, are composed of different layers of uh, old data and new data, for example, right? And so there's always a boundary where you, where you map those different mapping data with each other, where you link those two. And if you know exactly where those black spots are and where this boundary is, you will find those bugs almost immediately, okay? So this is another hilarious example I always keep in my mind. I'm unfortunately not really able to uh, show you our internal ones because my legal department uh, disallowed me <laughs> to show you that. But this, this is the last one. I also want to mention that. Do you know the blue hat bug? Has anybody heard about the blue hat bug? So this one managed to put thousands of emails into the inboxes of thousands of Microsoft employees. 
Now, how did that happen? Well, here one person sent an email from a distribution list, from an alias, to another distribution list with Microsoft Outlook six years ago or something like that. And then that user recalled that message. And what Outlook then did by design, it put all the recall messages in each individual inbox of all the persons on the initial distribution list. So each of those 8,000 guys on that distribution list at Microsoft then received about 1,200 mails. And this always reminds me that bugs are often found by applying specific features in a specific sequence. Okay, so that means it's a very simple rule, but I always keep it in, in my mind, right? It's not just one feature or a set of features applied independently. It's also about the sequence, how you apply them. And that reminds me of doing that. So I hope these are uh, free stories you wanted to hear. <laughs> really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. There's another question. We still have four minutes. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, by the way, do you have some uh, promotion for your guys uh, to exploration testing? For example, in my company, I'm manager, um, I have a weekly reward for best exploration bug. Uh, I call it golden bug. I give uh, uh, for a week, for the next week, uh, a small bug toy and bottle of the beer. Mm -hmm. For the best, expo best exploration back uh, till uh, last week, do you have something or how do you promote uh, guys, just manual testers, to, to find uh, some creative bugs? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and that's, that's a good way of doing that. We also do that. We call that uh, the blitz test sessions. That's one way we do that. So how, how, how do we do that? Um, it, it's basically chaos, so it's born out of chaos. <laughs> so what we do is when we get a new software product and we know, okay, we need to diversify it somehow, then we are running around in pure chaos in the company and trying to invite people for a 20-minute session, okay? That's what we do. Let's say, okay, just in 20 minutes or 40 minutes with us. We grab anybody we can grab, right? Put them together. Of course, we provide all the environments before, so they just need to sit down and use the products. And after that, um, we also give them promotions, gifts, like, you know, the one who finds the most critical bugs, for example, gets, for example, um, something from Amazon, right? Or gets a, a cup of coffee or gets some beers or something like that, right? So it's, 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 it kind of, you know, motivates the people and it's fun at the end of the day. Another thing we do is what we call the bug hunter sessions. So we, we have one week sprints at our company. So we release every one week, um, so a, a shippable product increment. And um, one day of that one week sprint, in one team, we say, you are now the bug hunter to anybody. It's a, a death or tester. And, and that bug hunter just tries to find bugs, okay? Everything can do to find bugs. Because testing is much more than just back hunting, okay? It's providing information, quality-related information. But on that day, or half a day, he just wants to find bugs, right? And then we also measure that and compare it, you know, to the, all the other bug hunter sessions we have. And then we evaluate, you know, the best bug hunt of the month or something like that, right? That also keeps the guys a bit motivated. And again, it's fun, okay? So that's basically what we do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>